Good morning, everyone. Now we know exactly who didn't stay out too late last night. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to invite up the Drupal.org uh, engineering team, our consultants, uh, and folks who work on infrastructure, volunteer on the security team. So let's bring everybody up on stage. That's right, that's that morning energy I want to see. <laughs> yeah, we got enough faces. All right, here we go. Um, so I'd like to share the faces of everybody who's involved in maintaining uh, Drupal.org in some way. So we have the Drupal Association engineering staff, members of the infrastructure team, and also some consultants, some new faces that you're seeing uh, who have joined us over the course of the last year uh, to help accelerate the work we're doing. So I hope you'll give a warm welcome to all of these people here. And if you see them throughout the con, feel free to say hello. Um, I also want to thank our infrastructure partners. In particular, Tag1 Consulting helps us manage the infrastructure for Drupal.org. And the Oregon State Open Source Lab is where we host most of the Drupal infrastructure today. Um, as we go further into this presentation, I just want to help get the word out if you somehow didn't see it already. Um, Drupal 7's end of life has been extended. Um, so moving forward, we'll be reevaluating the uh, end of life date for Drupal 7 on an annual basis. So at the moment, it's at least extended through November of 2023. And by July, we will be um, evaluating it again. Uh, also, if there is anyone in the room who is still using Drupal 6 in some form, the vendor-supported support for Drupal 6 will be ending in October of this year. So without further ado, I'd like to run into uh, a lot of the work that this team has been doing, and I'm going to be handing it off to different members of the team as we go. Um, as many of you know, groups.drupal.org is one of the sites that we manage to support community events, community organization, and as we come back out of the uh, pandemic, folks are getting back together, starting up events again, starting up meetups and things like that. So Caleb, I'd love to hand it to you, if we can get a mic over there, uh, to chat a little bit about some of the work you've been doing for us to create sort of the next generation of groups. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, so as you know, uh, community groups, many people use uh, Drupal.org to build, use, collaborate with other people in the community. Uh, to build up Drupal orgs, you know, uh, documentation, modules, themes, and things like that. Uh, so community groups was revamped uh, with the purpose of aiding those who want to uh, take full advantage of Drupal's community and its offerings and its, uh, how useful it is and help group them with like-minded individuals uh, to form groups and things like that uh, with people who are of like-minded individuals or other groups or also to diversify themselves as well. Um, so on launch, this part of the site will be available at uh, drupal.org slash community slash groups. And what it is is it'll list out all the groups that are um, it within the Drupal community. You can join these groups. Uh, you can subscribe to other groups. You can, and what you'll be able to do on, um, on these pages is you'll be able to see the recent posts that are going, uh, that people are talking about upcoming events. Um, you'll be able to view the current uh, members and admins. If you are a member, it'll link directly to your personal Drupal profile, um, you know, so you can go ahead and uh, increase your, um, your network and things like that that way. Um, so yeah, so it'll display the recent posts, upcoming events, it'll highlight the group members and admins. Um, and like I said, you'll be able to subscribe to different groups so that you can stay in the know. Awesome. Thank you, Caleb. And uh, we'll also be uh, offering some of the multilingual options for our international groups in the community groups section. And this is uh, in development, almost complete now, and hopefully rolling out soon to replace the existing groups.drupal.org. Um, we've also recently made some updates to release pages, some overhauls to provide more information um, to Drupal users. Um, before we go there, I want to say again, please feel free to gather, gather in. If we do questions later, that'll get you closer to the mic if you need to ask something. 
Um, but Brendan, let me hand it over to you to talk about the work you've been doing on Drupal.org's release pages. Sure, um, I'll keep it a little bit short. So uh, if you've been on a release page lately, you'll notice we have composer commands uh, now on compatible releases. That's very exciting. Um, there's not a lot else to say here other than you're all aware web development is not always exciting. Uh, we have ripped Panelizer out of release pages, which is exciting for us because it's one less thing we have to do to migrate on past Drupal 7. Um, yeah, so that's wonderful. Uh, next slide, please. Perfect. Um, now, well, now it's all release pages. So core also, uh, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, so we've got some more documentation here, um, some more guidance and trying to help people avoid some gotchas when it comes to doing composer things uh, with core. Um, and if you were at the uh, security panel yesterday, you will remember uh, Michael's advice about um, uh, about pinning versions um, and things like that. So there's more information about how to pin to a specific release and how to manage pinned versions when you do want to update and deliberately update to those specific versions. Uh, Brendan, you also worked on a refresh of org profiles. Can you talk through that real quick? Sure. Uh, the goal here uh, was to think about who might be going to organization profiles. Um, like most pages on Drupal.org, they're very information dense. Um, we tried to organize this a little better for folks who were coming to an org profile to figure out if they wanted to work with an organization. Um, so, you know, moving case studies up, giving them more prominent uh, positions so it's easier for people to see what an organization does with Drupal. Um, yeah, we've, we've also realized that those pages were super long. Uh, we've done some condensing of information, um, still highlighting some of the key indicators. You can see them in blue. Those are actually accordions, um, and you can expand it out, as you can see on the left of the slide, and really dive in if you want to. Um, you know, we realized it was too much information for the average, average person browsing around uh, organization profiles, but the information is still there if you'd like it. Awesome, thank you. Um, we also want to talk about the future of distributions, starter kits, and also publishing things that are not just traditional modules and themes uh, to the Drupal namespace on Packagist uh, for use with Composer. So for that, Ryan, let me hand it over to you to talk. Sure, yeah. Um, so traditionally on Drupal.org, we've supported distributions and it's sort of a drush make and tarball method of getting started with a distribution. And um, when we built packages.drupal.org, we didn't initially provide support for distributions to be started with Composer uh, because we weren't really sure how that was supposed to work. But over the time, oh, over time, the community has coalesced around a kind of standard practice of having a starter template for your distribution that you do a Composer create project to begin with, and then there will be you know the distribution profile itself that gets included in that. And so we've now uh, recently added support for general projects on Drupal.org, and we're going to suggest that distribution maintainers start putting their distribution templates on Drupal.org, and those general projects now automatically integrate with Packagist, so that uh, from a bare command line, you can start with Composer and say, Composer create project, Drupal slash um, your distribution name. Uh, so that's sort of what's on the next slide. Um, so uh, this will allow uh, the Drupal namespace still to be controlled by the DA so we can't have, you know, um, package poisoning kind of issues or anything with the supply chain attacks, but also to be able to leverage the Drupal namespace so things are in a familiar spot. But in adding this, we've also enabled other types of projects to be able to be hosted on Drupal.org. So if you want to upload a composer package and have it in the Drupal namespace, you can put that in a general project. You can put Drush extensions. We're going to try and migrate Coder over. So all of these different things that are not exactly modules or themes that probably should just live directly at Packagist can now be um, built on Drupal.org directly and managed there. Awesome. Thank you, Ryan. I also want to talk a little bit about the Drupal 9 upgrades that are in progress. As you may know, Drupal.org is often one of the later sites to move to the latest major version of Drupal because we have so much custom code and infrastructure for supporting the project that's really only used by us. Um, there are community members out there who have um, helped us to move forward by helping support custom modules or key modules that are used on Drupal.org. And that's actually a way that you can contribute if you're looking for something to do while you're here at the conference. 
Um, but to give a few specific highlights, um, I'll run through some of these, uh, and then I'll probably ask Narayan here to talk a little bit about some of our sort of strategy for, for doing these upgrades for Drupal.org infrastructure. But starting on some of the things that are a work in progress, so api.drupal.org is probably something that everyone here has used if you've done any module development or anything like that with Drupal. Um, so our team member, Fran, who couldn't be here today, he's in Spain, uh, has been focusing on this port, and he's completed porting all of the functionality, basically, the whole custom module, all of these things, um, over to Drupal 9. We're gonna get ready to, to launch this relatively soon. Um, we're now moving into sort of the theme layer uh, of this as well. So um, if you're not familiar with what happens on the back end, api.drupal.org basically um, uh, processes all of the branches in any given project pulls out the code comments, creates cross-linked references between areas of the code, and then provides developer reference information as has been committed to Drupal. So that's coming very soon. We're making really good progress there, um, and you should see that um, in the next three, six months, if not sooner. Um, Fran on our team has also worked on the Drupal.org project endpoints that we're using to support the project browser initiative. So you'll hear more about the project browser initiative in the Dries note tomorrow. Um, but the idea here is to allow folks to browse modules, themes, everything else directly within the Drupal interface, install them directly. Um, but to do that, we need a robust API for doing so from Drupal.org, and it needs to be on Drupal 9. We don't want to use a legacy API as we're building it out. Uh, so again, uh, we've begun the process of building the migrations of the relevant project-related content types on Drupal.org. There's a huge amount of work that's already complete, and this is a collaboration that's going to be ongoing with the Project Browser Initiative team moving forward. Um, but this is something that we were able to pivot to pretty rapidly in the last month or so and start making some serious progress based on the starting work that the Project Browser Initiative team had worked on. Um, so from here, let me hand it over briefly to Narayan. Do you want to talk a little bit about our kind of D9, D7 architecture strategy? Um, as people who have attended this talk before probably know, uh, Drupal.org is kind of a bundled legacy integration that we have been slowly working through to update to something maybe not modern, but at least current. Um, going through and rebuilding our HLE interface and things of that nature. D9 presents a more interesting challenge and opportunity in that we still have to run the D7 and in some cases D6 sites and endpoints while supporting D9 and its new version requirements. And while we already have multiple versions of PHP running on our web nodes, there's a limit to how many versions of PHP <laughs> I really want running on the web nodes. It's, it shouldn't be a collection. Um, so we're taking this opportunity to modernize our workflow a little bit and go towards more of a containerization approach and uh, in starting to stand up Kubernetes clusters, starting to migrate specific things over so that we can silo them away from each other. Um, so our Drupal 9 sites, when they launch, will be in containers built on a new workflow. Um, we are partnered with GitLab and are using GitLab for their container registry and building. So the entire development workflow and deployment process is going to be a lot more modern than what we currently do, which is basically Jen Jenkins and large bash scripts. Um, so it should be an opportunity for improvement. Um, at the moment, it's just an opportunity for a lot of work breaking things up. <laughs> but yeah. uh, it, it will get better at some point. Uh, currently, we have most of that done, and our next major step is going to be a large database upgrade to support the version requirements of Drupal 9. Yeah, and the, the first sites will be coming soon. They'll be our test case, probably something like API, um, again, the Drupal.org project endpoints, or um, the event site, which is going to get upgraded itself as well. Um, there's a few other things that are left. So we're working on a new authentication solution using Keycloak um, that will allow folks to use their Drupal.org identity across all the sites, including legacy seven sites and the nine sites, but also hopefully opening it up for uh, authentication of other sites and services. We still need to work on policies, but we'd love to let you use your Drupal.org identity uh, on a campsite, for example, and things like that. So 
or on chat services. We're, we're going to have to figure all that out, but we're in the process of building those things. There'll be an update to the theme, of course, for, for uh, Drupal 9 compatibility and to the production infrastructure in general. Um, as you may or may not know, the Drupal Association team also coordinates with uh, CORE, uh, the, uh, the folks who spend their time uh, kind of building the next generation primary features of Drupal. And there's been increasing collaboration between the teams, uh, especially around specific initiatives. So in one particular area, uh, really supply chain security and package signing, um, we are doing some work to support both the automatic updates initiative and the project browser initiative. So again, both of these are about making the sort of total cost of ownership of Drupal lower, making it easier to keep your site up to date, making it easier to find and install new functionality for your site, and easier to keep your site secure. Um, but for that to achieve all of its goals, we need to make sure that the integrity of what is being automatically downloaded and applied to your site uh, is verified. Um, so Neil, I'll have you talk a little bit about the tough framework that we're implementing and how we're doing the supply chain security here. Uh, so yeah, tough is uh, the update framework and it provides uh, signing for what you download from drupal.org, including packages.drupal.org. So when you're doing automatic updates, your site can verify that what you're updating to comes from a trusted source uh, is actually from drupal.org. Uh, and to prepare for that, we've been uh, s rearranging our packaging pipeline, um, the thing that makes the uh, downloads on each release page. Uh, there's a few other steps in that, uh, queuing up testing, um, and uh, we're going to be adding the signing step uh, to that, uh, so we need to do some pre-work to get that ready, and we have a contractor um, who built the system to implement uh, the update framework in PHP uh, on the server side, uh, or actually not in PHP, to uh, provide interfaces for us. Uh, it's all, uh, that is all in Python code. Uh, so we'll be able to slot that into the uh, packaging pipeline uh, in the next few weeks. We have to give thanks to Consensus Enterprises, who are partners on, on developing that um, package signing uh, server-side infrastructure. They are open sourcing all of that work that they've been doing for us as well. It'll be a project called Rugged um, that you can find on uh, GitLab. So if you happen to be someone who manages a large internal package manager for any reason, could be useful to you. It's also something where we're um, collaborating with folks like the Cloud Native Computing Foundation um, and the Open Source Security Foundation um, to sort of standardize supply chain security across a lot of open source projects. And we're hoping that the work we're proving out using the tough framework in Drupal can be adopted by other projects. We've had interest from Typo3 and Joomla. We're hoping that even Packagist itself may eventually adopt this and provide package signing across the whole PHP ecosystem. Um, I want to give a shout out to Ted Bowman, who's here in the audience as well. He's about to have a session tomorrow to talk about the Automatic Updates Initiative in more detail. So if you're interested in this particular topic, I would put that on your calendar as well. Um, we spoke a little bit already about authentication and single sign-on. So again, the idea here is we're going to be using Keycloak, another open source project that works with like OpenID Connect and similar OAuth. Um, and using that to connect simultaneously to our Drupal 7 and Drupal 9 sites with your Drupal identity, and then hopefully third-party community sites as well. Again, once we have worked out the policy for ensuring that the code of conduct is enforced and all those sorts of things. Um, just to give you a little bit of a preview of what that looks like, it's just a login page, it's not too fancy, um, but you'll start seeing this roll out relatively soon as a precursor to a lot of our migration work and these other projects. It helps us enable the ability to start running some of these systems with different requirements uh, in parallel with each other before we get every Drupal.org property on the latest version. Um, so with that, I'd like to now switch over to the tools we use to collaborate as a community, how we collectively build Drupal, and what serves the primary mission of the Drupal Association engineering team, which is providing you with uh, the power to do your work, to collaborate, to build a better Drupal project. And in particular, I want to talk about our GitLab Acceleration Initiative, because I know it's something that everybody's 
really interested in. This is the move from uh, the bespoke tooling that we've been using for years, more than a decade, to more fully adopting the GitLab tools and workflow. So let me hand it to Irina to talk about the goals and kind of the big picture. Um, and then I'll have the team talk through some of the specific next steps that are coming up. GitLab Acceleration Initiative is the second phase in the process of making code contribution to Drupal easier. Uh, Drupal code base is on uh, GitLab's for, since 2020. And in this phase, we continue adoption of standard tools and adapting them for Drupal ecosystem. Why can't we flip the switch right now? The GitLab workflow is designed by default for forking into individual contributors' share space, while Drupal project is much more collaborative. So this is why we need to adapt um, it for Drupal, work better for Drupal project. A collaborative uh, workflows. Here's how we're doing good. First, let's talk about what stays on Drupal.org and what will be on GitLab after project is completed. We get lots of questions about it. Projects, uh, releases, and endpoints, as well as contribution credit and user documentation still stay on Drupal.org. They're very Drupal-specific components. Uh, repositories, the code, is already on GitLab. So now we're in the process of replacing bespoke Drupal CI with more standard GitLab CI, adjusting it to work for a uh, Drupal project. And after that, we can flip the switch, uh, allow user, users to use issues, and before that, we need to migrate issues from Drupal.org into GitLab. And uh, this is major collaboration between Drupal community, Drupal association, and GitLab. And clearly defined roles and responsibilities allow us to move forward efficiently. Uh, we want to thank contrib all contributors to this project, especially Drupal Spons projects for expertise brainstorming and insights that you provided and continue to provide. Thank you. Um, here's a big picture of the project components uh, and what is left to complete. Three major steps right now are single sign-on between Drupal.org and GitLab. Uh, project releases stay where they are and right now we're working on <clears throat> right now, we're working on uh, GitLab CI, and next steps will be uh, moving issues. Uh, in this process, we're also simplifying uh, people's project and project pages. Now, let's talk how exactly we're doing it. Awesome. So we'll talk about a few quick wins first, sort of smaller components of this project in ways that we've simplified Drupal.org. Um, so Neil's going to talk about a few of these, uh, starting with just some features that we've enabled. Uh, so, yeah, when we started using GitLab, we kept it pretty minimal to have the transition go smoothly. Uh, but we've been quietly opening up more uh, profile pages in uh, GitLab. So, uh, yeah, under the preferences menus you see there, you can uh, we moved SSH key management to over, over to GitLab since we don't use your public SSH keys for anything other than commits. Uh, and we opened up the, where you could put the GPG uh, keys for uh, commit signing. Uh, so that's been available for a few weeks. Uh, and this is also where you configure your notifications. Um, you know, GitLab is always gonna be the best tool for sending its own notifications. We're not going to re-implement that. Uh, so if you want more emails, uh, that's where to go. Uh, and uh, yeah, they also have a authentication audit log. You can see what IP addresses you have, your account has been used at and make sure your account's not compromised. Uh, dark mode uh, for the code. 
And uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, we enabled GitLab's uh, full code search. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's available to search through all uh, full projects on Drupal.org. Uh, Drupal.org also in the past has maintained a uh, database, uh, database of all the commits, uh, which that, that was really the only maintenance we had on the old system since we weren't adding features very quickly. Uh, but that database is redundant and extra work to maintain going forward. So that means any place that there's been counts of commits and listings of uh, Git metadata on Drupal.org is being replaced by whatever GitLab provides. Uh, so the maintainers block, uh, you might remember, used to have those counts. Uh, now we're centering on who the people are. Uh, and you know, that was a longstanding issue as well because you know, not all projects uh, have code or focus on code contributions. So we wanted to get the people up center. Uh, docu uh, documentation uh, on there also was uh, uh, GitLab provides more places you can have documentation, so that block simplified a little bit. And uh, the development block, that's where the links are uh, to GitLab. And this will be changing more in the future. Uh, issues are going to GitLab, so that'll go away from project pages as well. Uh, same with profile pages. These are upcoming. Uh, that's another place where we have a list of how many commits you have to each project. So that's going to be replaced by something. And uh, we want a more prominent link to your get.drupalcode.org profile. Awesome. Um, so let's talk a little bit about GitLab CI, because that's the main uh, phase that we're in and sort of the largest current technical challenge uh, of this project. Um, so that's something that Ryan has been largely leading on our side, so I'll have you talk through sort of where we are and where we're going. Uh, hi, yeah. Um, so the transition over to GitLab CI is, um, it's, gonna, it's exciting, and it's really interesting because it means that there's a huge piece of code that we no longer have to maintain ourselves and can rely on, you know, a off-the-shelf solution that offers a lot of extra features. Um, one of the... One of the big challenges that we're uh, trying to wrap our heads around is like Drupal CI was very centralized and in its centralization meant that like there were configuration options that we set at the top level that everybody then inherited and it was like a very simple like you configure your project to run with certain versions of core and even core labels that would just stay on whichever version of core it was supposed to be. Uh, and GitLab CI is more of your configuration is in your repository as a GitLab CI.yaml file. And so what we're doing is uh, figuring out how to preserve some of the, here's the standard best practice that the community can use, in addition to enabling the community to do whatever sort of off, uh, off the garden path that they need to do to, for their specific project. Um, so every maintainer is going to have to set up a GitLab CI YAML file to be able to do this. Um, and uh, let's see. I think the main thing here is just configuring the defaults to, to allow that transition process to be easier. Yeah, I, I kind of covered this in the previous slide. So yeah, be, being able to have these defaults set so that um, we have a system in place that is a starting point for everybody that they can then deviate from. So. Um, uh, but then we're going to not have patch files anymore. There aren't patch files in, in GitLab, and so we won't be able to um, use those to run tests. We'll have to focus on merge requests. And you know, we're, we're working with GitLab on a way to have permanent links to permanent states in time for merge requests, because right now a merge request is a mutable object. It can change. And so if you have a build that's like, we want to run our site off of this changed version of this one module. We need to be able to have something that you can have securely in your build. So we're working with GitLab upstream on, on that sort of thing. Oh, sorry, that was oh, the... Oh, and that's, that's what the next slide was about. So Yeah, so, um, yeah, you know, the other thing about including patch files in your 
deployment is it's never really been a best practice to hot link to those artifacts in your deployment process, right? To just put in a URL to drupal.org. It's a habit that the whole community has been in and it's a habit we kind of need to break, right? We do want to have the ability to find stable URLs to a merge request or patch file that's not been applied upstream to the project you're using, but um, it's never been a great idea to rely on some random site on the internet for your deployment process to work, right? So we're trying to encourage the community to adopt new best practices, to com commit to a patches directory, to, com to keep your deployment artifacts so that they're repeatable. Um, again, rather than relying on a connection to outside sources. So um, the, the steps that we're taking to transition uh, Drupal, uh, Drupal CI to GitLab CI is kind of twofold. On one hand, we have uh, the community in the Drupal Spoons project looking for uh, best practices and ironing out different ways to test modules. And at the same time, we have to consider core as a sort of special case. And one version of core that always gets neglected is Drupal 7, uh, and particularly for security testing. So there's, there's, uh, it, it's sort of the edge case of the edge cases that we don't normally think about, and so we're starting there so that we get everything um, kind of covered. And so uh, figuring out how to run security tests with Drupal 7 is our first step, which should be easy because Drupal 7's testing needs are very, very simple, and so that's the uh, first thing that we're working on to be able to figure out how to get core transitioned over to running tests. And again, I want to emphasize what Irina said earlier. There's a lot of folks um, in the community who have stepped forward to help us test this out. So there are projects that are already using their own GitLab CI YAML files that are trying different ways to build a matrix of environments and Drupal versions to test against and sharing that with us so that we can use it to create the defaults that the community are going, is going to need to move to. Um, and again, there was the Drupal Spoons project that started several years ago to experiment with GitLab in general, and um, they've also sort of been reintegrated and are, are helping to share what they learned through that process back with us as well. So a thank you to them again. Um, so I'd also like to speak to contribution credit, which is another sort of aspect of this transition that's a little bit challenging, right? So as far as uh, I'm aware Drupal leads the open source world still in this concept of tracking our contributions, attributing them as individuals or organizations, on the clock or as a volunteer, weighting them by the usage of projects and sort of value of those contributions, and aggregating that together with your other activity on Drupal.org. And since that's not a tool set that exists in uh, other off-the-shelf developer collaboration tools, including GitLab, we need a, a strategy for, for preserving that. Um, but you know, before I get into exactly how to do that, I want to remind us that contribution is more than just issue credit, right? Uh, there's lots of other activity that we do um, that is factored into what we recognize as contribution to the Drupal project, right? So in the end, what this is for is building out your profile or building out your organization profile to talk about contributor roles that are sponsored by your company to talk about the documentation you've edited, to talk about the case studies you've created, but also to talk about the issue credits and the code collaboration and, and those direct contributions to Drupal. Um, so I'm gonna share some mockups that you've seen a little bit before and talk a little bit about where we're going. Um, GitLab is actually interested in doing some form of an attribution in a sort of a Drupal style. There's an open issue on GitLab.com to add this to the product. The CEO, uh, Sid, has marked it as something that he thinks would be an interesting initiative for GitLab themselves. Uh, but we don't want to necessarily rely on their roadmap to block or delay our own transition over to GitLab. So we're going to likely write a bot as an integration uh, to the GitLab issues when we migrate them uh, that will link you off to a Drupal.org kind of credit content <coughs> type where you do the attribution um, that you remember from what you're using today. Uh, and very likely, as GitLab begins to add their own version of this kind of feature, we'll start using that as a data source, pulling it in by API to sort of simplify the process of doing the attribution. Um, so that'll be coming soon, and that'll be part of sort of the issue migration uh, process. Um, and speaking of that issue migration process, Irina alluded to this earlier. Um, to us, it's very important to be collaborative by default in the way that we work. As you know from working on Drupal.org, right, we try and identify a problem and work together on that solution in a single issue, rather than doing a sort of fork-of-fork -fork model with five different uh, options for 
trying to resolve that issue worked on individually. So uh, Neil pulled some stats about the current level of collaboration. We'll share some of those and talk about what we're doing here. Uh, yeah, so yeah, Drupal's a bit unique in that multiple people tend to work on every issue and you, know, you, you don't know who the next person to work on the issue will be. Uh, so we're looking at ways to set up the GitLab permission model to enable that. Uh, and these are how many people were credited uh, on fixed issues in the last year. So on average, uh, about six people work on every core issue. And so to kind of illustrate this, we put together a little, little diagram of a fork merge versus sort of a Drupal workflow that we're trying to replicate uh, in GitLab. And they've worked with us uh, already on some uh, uh, permissions issues for this. So on the left, you can sort of see that traditional fork of fork of fork kind of workflow. And on the right is that collaborative by default workflow that we're trying to build towards. Uh, and Neil, could you talk about the migration prep? Right. So. With Drupal.org, we've in the past had everything locally in the database uh, uh, for the single site, and we can uh, have all sorts of cross-references. Um, here we have a change record, uh, which uh, Core in particular uses quite a bit. Uh, but all of these references to issues, um, we you know we won't have that when it's a when the issues are in a separate uh, software product. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're going to look at ways to replace this, uh, you know, replace the link to each issue with a URL uh, and uh, all of the inline references throughout the whole site, uh, those will have to be replaced somehow. Yeah, replace with redirects or something of that. So, sort. yeah, before we even start the migration, we need to audit uh, all of Drupal.org for all of these cross-references and replace them. Uh, and the actual migration, uh, once we uh, have all, all of the credit and references and everything in place, uh, you know, we'll go kind of the same way as the other uh, migrations, uh, such as is is enabling issue forks. Uh, you know, it's project by project. Uh, pro a few projects will be able to opt in at the start, and then it eventually we'll migrate the rest. Uh, and you know, we're preserving as much as we can. Uh, we need to do a complete migration. Other than, uh, otherwise, we'd have two issue systems if we stop halfway. And then we'd have double the work for the last uh, afterwards. And I've got to shout out the Drupal Spoons team again, because they've already written GitLab migration code from Drupal.org metadata that we can use as a starting point when we're coming up with our sort of final solution. Um, so if you're interested in the GitLab acceleration and ways that you could be involved or just follow along, there is a meta issue at that um, issue short link. Uh, there's the GitLab channel on the Drupal Slack. You can, also, of course, just help test these things as become available, leave your feedback in the issue queues, just using the merge requests as they exist today and noting any issues with that workflow as well. Um, you can start looking for projects that have GitLab CI enabled, and if you are a maintainer, just keep an eye out for more communications from us as more of these features begin to roll out and we start to do it progressively. Uh, so with that, I'd like to transition to Q&A. We have a microphone up in the center. If you have any questions about Drupal.org itself, about these projects or other projects that we didn't have time to sort of talk about today, We'd love to take your questions. Um, we'd love to talk about the DA itself, Drupal.org, this engineering team, anything you might have. So does anybody have thoughts, questions? Good morning, everybody. This hey, good morning. Yeah. Hey, uh, first I just wanna say thank you to everybody. Um, I've been doing this a while and it's a great time to be contributing to Drupal. Like all of these improvements are really incredible. Um, I was having a conversation last night in person with people. It was cool. Um, but we were talking about um, all of the different new tools to help enable contributions. So uh, the GitLab uh, IDE, uh, Tugboat previews, uh, now like Drupal Pod. And I was trying to explain how all of those things work together to help do things, and I couldn't quite wrap my head around it. So I was just wondering if all of you had ideas or any of you uh, had ideas for a kind of future state of 
how all of those different things could work together to enable? Yeah, you know, it's a good question. So um, to touch briefly on what some of these things are, um, so Tugboat is sort of a live preview project that'll give you a deployment preview of work in progress on Drupal.org that's sort of integrated into the Drupal.org issue queue now. Um, GitPod and therefore DrupalPod is a development environment for doing your contributions sort of all, all in the cloud. And I'm trying to remember, oh, GitLab's own IDE. Yeah, we have these multiple options. And the thing I will say about that is while we don't know necessarily how to rationalize them all into a single choice, it doesn't hurt to let these things sort of uh, not compete with each other, but try and sort of egg each other on into finding the best possible solution. And the other advantage of moving to GitLab as a standardized software stack is most of these tools can be built based on uh, the, the integration APIs that GitLab does have and then be brought into our own instance that we're running. So uh, I think as we get further through the migration, we may start doing more direct integrations rather than using your, you know, your DrupalPod browser extension, for example, to, to manage that stuff. We'll have to get there as we get a little closer down the line. Benji, please. Hi, can you back up a slide or two to the one with the change record? Uh, yes. Yeah. And, and the problem is that, um, so, so the issue link is um, a separate field, but then there are um, links in the body text. And right. it's those body text links that are the problem? Yep. In, okay. You're not the first team to have this problem, <laughs> you, you yeah. should talk to some of the Migrate API maintainers. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, we'll probably make a clever new text format to sort of reformat our, our issue short links into, uh, into new URL references or something like that. But yeah, we'll reach out. Hi. Hi, um, friend. I want to echo the thanks from everybody. You guys are awesome and taking on the Lord's work. Thank you so much for all this. We're really excited. Um, I, have a, I have kind of a hardball question, and then I have a softball question to kind of balance things out. The hardball question is, um, I, don't, I, I doubt at this stage you can give firm timelines, but do you have like a, a, maybe a, a sequence of events of like what the major milestones are and in what order they need to fall, just so we can have an idea of you yeah. know, what we would be doing. And I apologize if that was earlier. I, I got here a little late. Then the softball question is, if everybody could talk about their uh, favorite GitLab feature that we get for free, for free, as part of this uh, migration. So thank you. Yeah, OK. Um, so timeline-wise, yeah, sequence of events. Uh, again, GitLab CI, credit solution, and issue migration are kind of the next major milestones. And I think um, we're, we're right in the beginning of Q2. I'd like to see really good progress on CI through, through Q2 so that we can start the issue portion maybe Q3. So we're trying to move very quickly. And part of the reason why we, you see some new faces and some new consultants who have joined the team is to give us more capacity to do that. And that was possible because folks like Drupal Association members and others supported us and made it, made it uh, possible for us to expand that team. But it's, it's really our primary focus. So we would, um, I'm not gonna make any promises, but, <laughs> I would love to have maintainers be trans, uh, transferring over to GitLab CI from Drupal CI, Q2, Q3, and the beginning of the issue migration, maybe Q3, Q4, but we'll see. There are still also some things we need to escalate to the GitLab team and make sure we coordinate and line up. Right. Oh, sorry. The whole second half of the question. Excuse me. <laughs> Any particular favorite issues? We'll start from Neil and just go down the line. Um, Features. Yeah, I guess merge requests in general, like the code Picking reveal. the obvious one, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, that was going to be mine, merge requests. I, I, like I like the web IDE built into GitLab and the ability to do like multiple edits in one commit from a GUI. That's also really helpful for new contributors. We're going to have trouble remembering all the things. <laughs> not, not really, because there's not that many. Merge requests rock for code review. Um, I'm peppering Neil all day long with code review requests, and it's so handy to be able to have like line by line commenting and then resolving of issues. That's fantastic. Oh, and that's the other thing. We're doing it even for the internal Drupal.org work. We're trying to do it as much as possible in our same GitLab instance to, to sort of practice these things. Um, for my part, it's the uh, in GitLab CI, there's uh, kind of a plethora of features that are like someday we're going to build this in Drupal CI, someday, and then they're already there. So, for example, uh, being able to bring your own containers, like if you need a Elasticsearch container so you can run tests on your search API module, uh, that's just built in by default. You can set up whatever sort of environment you need and 
that's, that's really exciting because that enables uh, a lot of projects to be able to, to test. Um, I would say mine personally, since I'm a rookie, I'm fresh meat coming into the Drupal world, uh, would be the expansion of the contributor roles and um, there being more uh, options in order to build your Drupal profile uh, through contributions. Um, since I'm you know, kind of new to the game, uh, one of my biggest goals is to be able to build out my Drupal profile and, and knowing now that making changes through code is not the only option in order for, uh, for me and you know, new people like me to be able to build my uh, Drupal profile. Um, that's going to be very useful and it's also going to be very inspiring um, to you know, be motivated to get in there and, and do other things and, and say, hey, I can make a change. It's, it might be documentation or it might any, anything else that's uh, possible to do uh, other than coding. You know? So I feel like that's going to be very useful for a lot of people. Awesome. My favorite feature in GitLab, in addition to all of the above, is Web ID, because I believe that Cloud ID is for coding what CMS was for web publishing some 20 years ago. And having this integrated cloud solution for coding is totally amazing. Uh, the sidekick offload web server. <laughs> 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 to expand on that, um, uh, I've been running this thing for quite a while and it's gone from Git web to VPC to CGit to a hacked version of all of those things. And uh, GitLab's process of migrating long running processes from the main web server that serves UI to a sidekick server that can handle long running processes in a more evented uh, model means it can handle around 10 times the load in testing and it pages us much less. Uh, and I will add a meta feature, which is the fact that we have a literally multi-million dollar company developing new collaboration features for Drupal uh, is really nice. There've been at least monthly releases that have included fixes that we've directly prioritized, new features that we've directly asked for, and um, just being able to stay on the edge of that instead of doing one big effort having to turn to other things and have our tools fall behind, right? That can go in parallel and we can focus on the things that are unique to the Drupal community, so. Hi, thank you to everyone. This work is amazing. Um, I wanted to share and ask your opinion on, um, I, see, I feel like the issue migration is a huge challenge and opportunity. It feels like the most visible uh, yeah. um, transition maybe surpassing merge requests in a way that as excited as I am about Drupal CI or uh, GitLab CI as a maintainer, like there are going to be people that are suddenly, uh, you know, re-engaged with this migration in a way that they're not when they suddenly land on an issue and it's in the uh, GitLab uh, and it looks like GitLab. So is there a way to leverage that interest potentially? You know, I know you just shared the timeline, the potential timeline for issues, but how can we get more people involved, use that as an opportunity to get more people involved with this process? How can they contribute specifically to issues? Because I think that's a place where people will potentially get excited about helping. It's a really good question because we have to be super careful because of the cross references between issues. We don't want to like, orphan you by having half, like three projects migrated, three projects not migrated, and, and kind of have a confused experience. So it's something we're still thinking about. I mean, Neil, did you have thoughts? Yeah, I mean, uh, we have some of the initial code from Drupal Spoons, but that's kind of the easy 80% and have a lot of detailed migration work and you know make sure that that's all, uh, you know, we're doing a complete smooth migration. Uh, so, uh, and then the other half of it is once they're migrated, figuring out the best practices for, uh, you know, Kanban boards and all of the features that GitLab has, like, yeah. how do you best use those in an open source project productively? I, I will uh, say also, uh, as you maybe saw in the middle there, we are planning to sort of go project by project as this goes. So we will likely be soliciting people to say, hey, if you're particularly interested in having your process disrupted so we can learn and, and giving us that feedback, like 
we'll, we'll sort of start with you as a, as a smaller group of maintainers um, and be able to move from there. So there's some problems to work out first. We'll take the last question and then we'll get ready for the keynote. Okay, apologies if you've already covered this, but um, like for community projects, I guess we just move our issues into GitLab and then the, cre the new credit bot is going yeah, so to serve Yeah, so we want to make sure to provide the same attribution options via the new credit bot for non-code projects as well using that new issue queue. Absolutely. And okay, thank, thank you very much, everyone. We really appreciate your time. And in about 15 minutes, the next keynote's going to be happening.